It's, it's really a pleasure to welcome uh, Mimi Scheller today. Um, Mimi, um, the best way to introduce her would be to say she's one of the leading voices um, in mobility studies, the study of mobilities, uh, which uh, for those who don't know much about it, I hope Mimi can tell us a, a little bit more, because most of us don't know much about it. It's not uh, exclusively the study of mobile phones, which uh, some people think. But institutionally, um, Mimi is professor of sociology at Drexel, uh, where she founded, she's the founding director of the Center for Mobilities Research and Policy. Um, she also uh, is the founding co-editor of the journal Mobilities, uh, which I knew <laughs> through your work. Uh, she's also an associate editor of Transfers, which is an interdisciplinary journal of, of mobility studies. Uh, Mimi has published a lot on uh, issues of mobility, um, the city, um, the urban, um, modernity. Um, she has many books, many articles to her credit. Um, you can look those up on her official uh, 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 biography. Um, she received her AB from Harvard and an MA and PhD from Princeton. Um, she's uh, I'm sorry, from the new school. Um, I'll take I'm, I'm, this is, yeah, the, the, uh, the font is too small for me. Um, but she's held a visiting fellowship at the Davis Center at, at Princeton, um, at Media at McGill in Canada, in Montreal, and then at the Center for Mobility and Urban Studies at Olberg in Denmark, and also at the Penn Humanities Forum. So I won't, I won't say more. Uh, Mimi, welcome. We're very happy to have you. We look forward to what you have to say. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm really happy to be able to join you. Um, and this has n almost nothing to do with my talk, but my new book just came out, so <laughs> I brought a copy along. Um, and if anybody wants to browse through it, you feel free to. And um, so this talk draws on my experience of working on two NSF-funded research projects in, that took me to Haiti over the last four years. And in both of them, I was collaborating as a social scientist with engineers and other kinds of scientists. And I took it as an opportunity to sort of study what they were doing. It's a, a, a kind of reappropriation of the, um, the NSF grant. Um, so. I'll just, I'll tell you what those projects were, but this talk is not actually about these projects. I just sort of used the opportunity. So the first one related to local participation in planning water and sanitation infrastructure in and around the city of Leogon after the January 2010 earthquake. Um, and it, it involved the, you can see Leogon just uh, to the west of Port-au-Prince and it was the epicenter of the earthquake and was badly affected by the earthquake. And we were using forms of kind of participatory um, workshops and surveys to sort of talk to local people about uh, their water and sanitation needs. And the second one, more recently, was um, relating to. Okay. Okay. I'll just wait till that stops. Okay. Um, this relates to the rising water levels of two lakes, Lake Azue in Haiti and Lake Enriquillo in the Dominican Republic. You can actually see the two lakes um, just on either side of the border to the east of Port-au-Prince. Um, and it's on um, uh, looking at the, whether climate change is uh, causing that and what the effects are. So I want to gratefully acknowledge the NSF support for this work and for my colleagues there who enabled me to be part of these two projects. But the talk I'll give is not directly related to either of them. Instead, as a scholar of Caribbean studies, Caribbean history, mobilities research, and mobile communication, I became fascinated with kind of reflecting on my experience during these two research projects and appropriating it for somewhat unintended purposes. Drawing especially on my own critical observations of the humanitarian response in post-earthquake Haiti, this talk explores how natural disasters demobilize and also remobilize, 
how they produce uneven mobility and communication networks that reinforce unequal distributions of what I'll call network capital and exacerbate the uneven access to communication networks. And this is just an outline. The talk has four parts. Um, I'll probably be rushing a little bit by the time I get to the end. And the end parts are, I would say, the first two parts are based on some work I already did, and then the latter parts are more speculative sort of things I'm starting to think about or might want to do. So part one, on the making of uneven Hertzian space. So disasters strike at mobility systems, but they also engender their own unique mobilities and immobilities. When emergency responders, relief workers, um, military or other kinds of armed peacekeepers and soldiers begin to move into a disaster affected area, they not only take control of infrastructures of physical mobility, such as roads, airports, ports, but also communications um, systems, communication networks, and they have access to their own topologies of Hertzian space, by which I simply mean the uh, cell phones, radio waves, satellite communications, mobile GIS platforms, you know, Google Earth Maps, all that stuff that sort of can be downloaded on location to wherever you are. Hertzian space has been described as the electroclimate inhabited by humans and electronic machines, i.e. it's the interface and the architecture of physical interactivity between devices and people as Anthony Dunn described it in Hertzian Tales. So focusing on the use of mobile communication, remote data collection, aerial vision technologies, and high-tech visualizations that are assisted by satellites and aerial photography, first um, I want to think about and, and to try to show how disaster logistics produce this highly skewed communication system. And secondly, that that contributes to the exclusion of local participants in key recovery and rebuilding activities after a disaster. And that includes not just everyday people, but local government, civil society organizations, um, and lots of others. And this will lead me to ask how we might raise awareness about these communication gaps and bridge this uneven topology by building connectivity across differentiated communication platforms and really sort of putting that at the forefront of what we're thinking about when sort of responding in situations like this, and also thinking about how to work with local appropriations of communication technologies into everyday life. So sort of beginning from where people are at. So I'll, I'll just really quickly skim through some of the theoretical approaches. Um, and in particular, the recent turn towards materialist approaches to media and to mobility. So there has been this effort to investigate communication um, not just as the content or the image or the message that's being relayed from one point to another, but as an embodied spatial practice that produces various kinds of space-time and is itself constitutive of social orders. And I hear I'm drawing on the work of um, Jeremy Packer and Steve Wiley. And in their work, they build on the earlier approaches of James Carey on the materiality of communication, especially in its relation to transportation networks, such as the train and the telegraph, but kind of updating this view for the, you know, sort of mobile communication age, and also incorporating more recent mobilities theory, which pays attention to the material infrastructures and what we call the moorings of mobility and communication systems. Um, and there's a couple of articles of my own here that, where we sort of talk about this relation between mobility and moorings and um, also forms of channeling and control. So together, these approaches lead me to think about what some have called constellations of mobility, and they're physical and sort of digital constellations. And they involve various kinds of turbulence, potential disruptions, slowness, waiting, cues, differential speeds, all these different things come into both the physical and the digital communication constellation. And they also can involve various kinds of friction, and you can think of friction both as a slowing down, but also as enabling. Like think about why you wear rubber-soled sneakers, because a certain amount of friction 
lets you do certain things. So friction isn't always a bad thing, but it can become too sticky depending on the situation. So the material turn in media studies and mobilities research highlights political questions surrounding infrastructure and how it is produced. Um, and I draw on the Susan Starr's idea of infrastructuring. So for example, Heather Horst has done ethnographies of communication infrastructure in the Caribbean, and I'll refer to her work since I'm working on the Caribbean, where she builds on Susan Lee Starr's foundational work on infrastructuring as an active practice. There's an ongoing struggle over infrastructure, not just who has access to it, but what shapes it will take and what uses we sort of put it to. And she finds that there's, on the one hand, there are the big communication companies operating in the global south with a certain degree of latitude that gives them leverage over the state capacity to regulate them. So if you think of a country like Jamaica, where she works, she says that the telecom company Digicel transformed the telecommunications industry in Jamaica and subsequently it moved into other island markets in the Caribbean and the Pacific. So Digicel kind of had the power to disrupt the business model of what had been national carriers with state monopolies over a kind of national space um, and a national media structure. And so they created, created um, a fissure in these national infrastructures but also brought new possibilities for transnational imagined communities to create other kinds of public space and social networks and mobilities. So while states can exercise control from above, um, Horst also looks at the way in which people try to appropriate or hack the system, game the system from below. And they do that through various forms of appropriating technology, which redirects infrastructuring into everyday social practices. So that's kind of the, the background I'm thinking of theoretically. And Horst and her collaborators in particular have studied the, the relations of mobile communication on the Haitian-Dominican border. And she looks at how users tried to navigate the competing infrastructures on that border. Um, by you know switching SIM cards and things and switching which phone they were using as they crossed the border. So her work reminds us of the material grounding and the spatial frictions of infrastructure and the constellations of people, devices, networks, laws, and regulations that together enable any communication to be unevenly produced, distributed, and consumed. Information flows, in other words, and the ways in which they shape space, states, and subjects are highly uneven, they're performed, and they're also performative. They're materialized, but they're also in other ways dematerialized. While these issues are often backgrounded in, say, countries like the USA, where we just assume we'll pick up our phone and sort of make a phone call, we should remember that all communication infrastructures, including the mobile interfaces we rely on every day, are what Horst calls dynamic, a dynamic process that is simultaneously made and unmade by companies, by audiences, and by regulators. Okay, so with that in mind, this kind of making and unmaking of infrastructure, I'm going to turn to, to part two on topologies of humanitarian technology. And this draws on um, an article I've already published called The, um, the Islanding, or sorry, Islanding Effects, Mobility Systems and Humanitarian Logistics in Post-Earthquake Haiti, which is in Cultural Geographies. The infrastructure for producing, distributing, and accessing information especially moves to the foreground of people's consciousness during disasters when it often breaks down. First, consider the aerial view from the airplane window, like this one. And think about how even this is a very complex view. Um, if, you know, if you've been on the airplane, it's no big deal, right? You look out the window and take a picture, like I did here, picture of Haiti. But it was dependent on my access to a whole lot of different things, um, a passport, a plane ticket, all of the kind of data readiness that is behind air travel today to sort of present yourself at the airport and have filled in all that, all those electronic forms. But also beyond that, it required 
in this, at this particular point in time, a series of vaccinations, malaria pills, insect repellents, a first aid kit to secure my body while I traveled, and of course, monetary funds and international cell phone pr um, uh, program, and a phone that also functioned as a camera and a wireless internet device and onto which I had loaded special apps like a Crayol dictionary and a satellite map of Haiti. So I came like equipped with all this stuff and partly that's what enabled me to snap the picture from the airplane. Um, but together this generated forms of what I call following Elliot and Ari, network capital. And network capital includes forms of access to things like legal documents, such as driver's licenses, passports, visas, residency papers. It also includes access to sorts of um, vehicles and infrastructure. Um, and the highest forms of network capital inv involve private vehicles and premium infrastructure. <laughs> and it involves access to location-free information and connection to networks at a distance. Um, by location free meaning locative media where you can get it from wherever you are and things like the time and means for complex coordination of meetings and information and data flows um, all at the right place at the right time. So using this lens of critical mobilities theory and ideas of network capital, I want to show how the specific use of aerial views, mobile GIS, and data visualization technologies produces uneven spaces and differential network capital, which is especially problematic in the process of post-disaster decision-making, planning, and reconstruction and recovery processes. These applications of virtual mobility via informational mobility are not innocent, and they're not always just, you know, being helpful or humanitarian, but they're directly related to the operationalization of mobility regimes, ones that enabled foreign travel into Haiti and foreign control of logistics, while largely preventing Haitians from leaving the country, marginalizing their own self-representations, and actually interfering with their own self-determination of the rebuilding process. So the implementation of the disaster response in Haiti involved a huge mobilization of technologies to track and map all sorts of things, like the distribution of aid, the actors involved, the actions taken. And I'm going to go through a few ways in which that was done. First, there was aerial surveillance and inf information gathering from the sky. And that was rapidly deployed around Haiti right after the earthquake by external institutions ranging from the US military to the World Bank. Here is a Piper PA-31 Navajo, which in July two, 2011, the New York Times um, writes, um, the, the Piper Navajo took off into the sultry Miami morning and streaked southward toward the Caribbean. High over Haiti, the cameras inside began to snap. Behind this reconnaissance mission was, of all things, a financial institution, the World Bank, symbol of globalization and to many the hubris of wealthy nations. But this was hardly some clandestine operation. On the contrary, the aerial photographs taken that January morning, shortly after a pow powerful earthquake leveled much of Port-au-Prince, were soon uploaded to the web for all to see, along with an invitation to help World Bank specialists assess the damage and figure out how to aid Haiti. Okay, so this was a rapid deployment of aerial reconnaissance by a global financial institution, which notably had immediate access to Haitian airspace and could take the data and make it open for all to see meaning those with the network capital for internet access and ability to read aerial photos. And then they said it would be analyzed by their own specialists rather than by Haitians themselves. And the article states that more than 600 engineers in 21 countries analyzed the data collected over Haiti and their conclusions, essentially what to rebuild and where, have since been used by the Haitian government, relief organizations, companies, and myriad others. Okay. Now, contrast that with the fact that those working in Haiti and reviewing what happened, and especially, I, I mean, some of us were saying it during what was happening, but also after what happened, have called for much stronger local participation in decision-making and planning processes. My own observations suggested that such participation was not taking place at any level during the, the post-earthquake response. So the World Bank's alleged opening of data for good purposes 
is actually kind of wresting control over Haitian airspace, taking territorial data and decision making away from Haitians and giving power instead to myriad others. So that's just one sort of simple example. Here's um, another one. Secondly, humanitarian responders, not to mention academic researchers, engineers, armed forces, and others, arrive in Haiti equipped with various kinds of mobile informational technologies for gathering, geotagging, and mapping information. This was the equipment my own modest research team employed, these little mobile mappers that could geotag features within the grid marked on this map. So we could, you know, in advance produce the, the map of the département of Léogane with its nine communes, and we could put a grid on, and we could sort of get our little mapping thing out and go around and start going through this grid and putting in, um, I think we did about 95 different features of water and sanitation. Um, and then we also could mark it up with little circle areas, which are where we sent out um, surveyors to, to survey people. And, the, you know, it's significant that this kind of detailed gridded map could be generated from afar. And it's already a significant technology that was not generally available inside Haiti. So even the local mayor's office in the town of Leogan had nothing like this kind of mapping technology available to them. Um, so just mapping itself and being able to geotag map. Secondly, um, or I should say thirdly, after the, so we have the aerial surveillance, the sort of mapping. Here is the United Nations peacekeeping um, force known as MINUSTA, their base outside of Leogan, with a very strong communications infrastructure. At their bases, they have satellite dishes, they have radio and cell towers, um, which are sort of sticking up in the background, and, um, you know, guard towers, barbed wire, etc. cetera. Um, but the humanitarian responders are themselves sort of linked into this communications infrastructure in a way which Haitians were not invited to link into this communications infrastructure. So for example, on the bottom right is a meeting that I went to of the, the WASH cluster, that's water, sanitation, and hygiene. They held meetings at the UN base and they used mobile phones, laptop computers with internet connections to communicate and share inter information. Um, it's a little hard to see, but various people at this meeting have their cell phones sitting on the table. They have their big watches on their wrists. Um, and we also had to go through a military checkpoint to get to the WASH cluster meeting. We needed to show our passports, and I actually saw Haitian journalists being turned away. They weren't allowed onto the base. Um, it turned out this may have been a slightly unusual situation because right after this meeting ended, this entourage shows up and who steps out? But Bill Clinton and Paul Farmer were like visiting the base right when I was there, which was really funny. It's like, oh, you just dropped by. Hi, hi, Bill. Um, <laughs> so, so that, so that kind of, anyway, sort of dis, uh, distribution of the, your, their own personalized infrastructure is very common now in all sorts of responses, military, humanitarian, and otherwise. Um, the next thing I want to point towards is this next degree of empowering visioning technologies, which depend on satellite imaging coupled with Google Earth, which was used extensively for disaster response in Haiti. After the earthquake, the global media were awash in satellite images of the damage, many of which drew on the GOI satellite. And coupled with Google Earth, that now adds this entirely new dimension to aerial vision, <coughs> allowing the technologically empowered to virtually kind of zoom in and out of topographical satellite maps of Haiti, which are geotagged with information, photographs, other kinds of GIS data, including on this one, the placement of latrines. These are like the installations of toilets and sanitation and latrines by various um, humanitarian groups. So all the little green triangles represent where you could find some toilets. Um, the small print at the bottom notes that the imagery of this GOI and digital globe draws on data from <coughs> SIO, NOAA, US Navy, NGO, and JEBCO satellites. Those are so five different satellites, this very powerful array of Earth observing low space orbital optics that kind of feed into this system. And 
After the earthquake, a community um, formed known as the Global Earth Observation Catastrophe Assessment Network, or GEOCAN. In order to use crowdsourcing techniques to have engineers and scientists around the world compare before and after satellite images and, and then later aerial photographs of building damage. So here, the, the sources of imagery included that um, the World Bank aerial missions that I mentioned from their little hyper Navajo airplane, but also aerial missions that were flown by Google, Pictometry, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And then this large volume of high resolution satellite imagery transferred into the public domain by Digital Globe and GOI. So they were combining <coughs> things like LIDAR data from the aerial missions and the satellite imagery, plus later oblique aerial imagery from pictometry and in-field survey photos. So they're getting photos from a whole lot of different viewpoints, vantage points, and then combining them to assess building damage and other kinds of infrastructure damage. While all of this is extremely valuable, and you know we depend on it after disasters, these externally controlled modes of surveillance, aerial visioning technologies, and GIS integration into real-time mapping nevertheless reinforce the very technologies for mobility control, for example, so-called smart borders, and the infrastructure management by outside experts that work together to reinforce social inequalities, to remake uneven spatialities, and to recreate subjects with differential network capital. Only some groups have access to these powerful aerial views, information databases, and the related mobility and communication technologies. So for example, while, while I was able to navigate the back roads of Leogon by downloading highly detailed local maps of Haiti using a free iPhone app called Gaia Earth, coupled with a relatively costly AT&T international data plan, I saw that very few Haitians had broadband access or the kinds of mobile smartphones that allow those with network capital to make use of these kinds of mobile geomapping technologies, including no members of the government, very few members of the local, um, even local professional community, and no, no members of community-based organizations. Um, and especially given post-earthquake electricity shortages, like even if you had these things, it was difficult to keep them charged. Um, and of course, our team of engineers came with their own little solar-powered chargers for our devices. So this enabled outsiders to create what Bruno Latour calls centers of calculation, in which information is channeled and controlled via disaster management organizations, technologies, and infrastructures based outside of Haiti. Now, on the other hand, it's worth saying that some digital humanitarians did attempt to connect their data collection with communities on the ground using open source maps, crowdsourced information, and shared verification processes to comb through localized reports from various sources. So groups like Ushahidi worked to aggregate, verify, and curate this data into open source GIS mapping platforms. And here's, um, uh, they describe um, their, their crisis maps where they gathered reports from inside Haiti via SMS, web, email, radio, phone, Twitter, Facebook, television, listservs, live streams, situation reports, and volunteers. Um, and they kind of brought that into what they called the situation room at the Fletcher School in Washington, D.C. and other, a few other sites in near real time. The volunteers there identified GPS coordinates for the reports, geotag them, uh, using OpenStreetMap, they make the whole thing available under a Creative Commons license. So th at least this kind of open mapping project it suggests ways in which micro-level disaster news and information might be made accessible and searchable by location so that interested parties can share information, zero in on specific sites or on specific types of information. People can add their own filters or overlays concentrating on particular things. And this kind of zeroing in is suggestive of the ways in which remote info systems allow the user to zoom in at different scales, dipping into locations marked with different proximity to events. One can switch scales and perspective between different eyewitnesses, aggregators, local sources, or national commentators. So this did at least give some Haitians access to remotely input reports into these systems and for some opened up access to these reports through other kinds of web platforms. 
And such tools have, are now considered you know, mandatory and crucial for any kind of crisis mapping and global humanitarian organizations. So my argument is not to say that we should stop all of this altogether. We shouldn't stop a satellite and aerial mapping or humanitarian data collecting. But what I am saying is that we need to more carefully consider the ethics of data collection, data sharing, visualization technologies, and the uses to which they are put in restructuring spatial relations and mobility systems that were already grounded in neocolonial and militarized relations of power. If we're not aware of that, then we're not asking the right questions. And this is where I want to start branching into more speculative stuff that I haven't quite researched yet, but that I started to think about during this trip. And I've started to publish a little bit on with um, Adriana de Souza e Silva. We've just edited a collection called Mobilities and Locative Media that will be out this year. And I want to talk now about shifting to local appropriation of mobile communication technologies. So my argument so far is not simply that aerial vision technologies such as Google Earth or GIS systems are by default cultural representations of power holders, like earlier forms of colonial cartography. They, in some ways they do that, right? They reinforce kind of empire via this disembodied gaze, master gaze. But that's not really the main part of my argument. What I want to argue is that only if such technologies are put into practice with the democratizing aim to maximize the mobility capabilities and network capital for all, only then will they contribute to greater mobility justice, which ultimately, I think, can reduce future vulnerabilities to disaster. So this is about mobility justice. How do we get past the, the ways of um, uh, that this, the technology is being used and think about how to advance mobility capabilities using a kind of capabilities approach. So to understand this better, I want to begin to turn to actual on-the-ground appropriation of mobile communication technologies within Haiti to see what is actually going on. And I'm going to begin with this paradox, or perhaps parable, of the Oxfam solar-powered water kiosk, which I found in Belloc, a small village outside of the town of Leogan. This is when I returned on my second research trip, so it was in 2013, not in 2010. But here was a very carefully built kiosk on the left for UV fil filtration of water. That's okay. <laughs> so rainwater, in the black tank on the roof, rainwater could be collected, and then solar-powered UV filters would turn it into potable water that would be safe for the entire community to drink. And there was a special setup of um, taps where people could <coughs> drink, get drinking water, where they could wash, place for the water to run off. It was really nice. It was built probably in about 2012 as a longer-term solution to the need for clean water in a remote rural community. But there we are in visiting in 2013, and we go to turn on the taps and see the great potable water flowing out, and that nothing came out. There was no water running. And so we asked, um, we had these water engineers with us, and we were like, maybe they could fix it. And they're like, let's go see what's wrong with this thing. So we asked to look inside the kiosk, and they, some guys go and get a key. They unlock it. They open the door. And that's what is inside, which you, you can't see from the back. There's dozens of cell phones and a few laptop computers charging off of the solar panel. And then I was like, oh, I know what's wrong with this system. They don't need an engineer. They need a sociologist. So I call this an appropriation of technology. Because clearly, this community, for complex reasons, it's not like simple, they didn't want a water filtration kiosk, as had been assumed by the humanitarian organization that built it. What they wanted was a cell phone charging station. Now, I didn't have time to get to like the bottom of how this came about exactly, but there might have been someone running a business delivering and selling treated water, which is a big local business in Leogan. Or maybe there was just a greater need for electricity. Maybe someone was making money off of charging other people's phones, like they had appropriated the kiosk to run their own little business here. Maybe it was the, the grand dame, the, the big men in the community whose decision making had outweighed the needs of poorer women in the community who maybe wanted the water because they had to go and fetch all the water and do all the washing and everything else. 
But whatever the reason, the water kiosk had been repurposed. And this alerts us to several things. First of all, if local people don't make decisions about infrastructure, it may well fail, at least fail in its stated aims. Secondly, communications infrastructures may be more essential in the medium term after a disaster than even water, food, or shelter. So people really wanted their phones to work. They wanted that more than they wanted like clean water on the spot. They could get water some other way, but they really needed phones that worked. And see, even in small rural villages, there's some pretty sophisticated mobile communication technologies at hand. I mean, we were down dirt roads in the middle of nowhere and found all this stuff. So that was sort of one lesson that I would like to sort of pursue further about the sort of mismatch between projects that have not consulted local communities about what they need. But secondly, that phones and other communication technologies may become very important parts of people's self-fashioning and embodied practice, even in post-disaster like situations. So here, for example, is a young man in a camp for displaced people from Leogun in, um, during the earthquake. And it turns out that he was a dance teacher and choreographer for a children's dance troupe known as Rasan de Leogun, or Roots of Leogun. And even in the midst of this tent camp for displaced people in a field, he was wearing his phone around his neck with his earbuds on and his Celtics baseball cap. And it was an important symbol, an important tool, an important fashion item, and connection to music, to his you know, profession and what he did. And using all of those skills and resources, he assembled the dance troupe of children to perform an amazing dance. I mean, they were living in tents, and they, but they wanted to come out and show how, what they could do. And, um, and he needed the phone to sort of make that happen. And thirdly, this was at, at the same location, um, a mobile DJ set up for a local celebration. It was a Mother's Day celebration. They made me dance, which was very embarrassing. Um, and it included a very up-to-date Apple laptop computer. And accessing and distributing music is, in fact, a really important driver of appropriation of new communication technologies in the Caribbean. I mean, elsewhere, too, but especially in the Caribbean. And mobile social networks can be sort of made purpose for the purpose of spreading and distributing music and accessing music. And they're highly localized, but they also span international borders and play a really important role in spreading news, including new songs across diasporas, which are connected emotionally and imaginatively to a homeland. So and when I, when I say they're using um, sort of social media, so rather than remaining regional or national, these imagined communities are creating communication networks distributed across social media. I mean not just um, like Facebook or Twitter, but different. they're mixing different kind of platforms. They're using as social media radios, tape recordings, um, online social networks, but also live events like this with sound systems, a mobile sound system which was delivered to the location and set up. And it can be everything from a local party to a big music festival, big international music festival. And these are forming these important transnational spaces for information production, aggregation, dissemination, and consumption, which sounds a little bit like what needs to happen in a disaster, post-disaster, like sort of humanitarian digital network. And it's like, well, there is a network. It already exists. It's, it's happening all the time. So, Maybe we need to tap into that network. So we need to ask, how can this kind of network of mobile communication be integrated into disaster response as more than just a source of data for others outside of Haiti to use? How can it be used to get information and even more essentially um, things like money, mobile money, to people on the ground? And we know that the cell service provider Digicel is ubiquitous throughout Haiti. Um, here's just a little picture. It's red umbrellas. Digicel's like color is red, are everywhere. And their advertising logos appear in every market and every street and you know get 
reappropriated in all sorts of ways that their brand manager probably wouldn't appreciate. But data from Digicel on cell phone usage after the earthquake actually helped support um, indications of the number of people who moved out of Port-au-Prince into provincial areas in the weeks immediately after the event. And the cell phone record showed how many people left and then how many people came back in a few months later just by connecting to different cell towers. Um, so people be can become tracers of population movement and the visualization of that kind of traffic data has provided one new dimension for reporting who and what is moving where, offering new kinds of global and regional knowledge. But such networks also suggest that a reverse flow, not pulling data out, but conduits for pouring information in and resources and mobile money back to where it's needed most amongst the disaster affected population. So let me, oh, I forgot I added this slide. Um, and, and this is one more example from my more recent research crossing the Haitian-Dominican border of um, Blancs or foreigners negotiating network capital at the border. And I put this in to say that even those with high network capital, like the German engineer on the left in the blue baseball cap, can be appropriated by various others um, that they can try to, you know, shake them down for some of that, that money that they're carrying with them and all of their network capital. Um, he's holding a cell phone. He's trying to make calls, blah, 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 blah. But the guys on the Dominican border still got hundreds of, of dollars, pesos and gourds off of us. And I wrote um, an article about that called Mobility, Debordering and Territoriality on the Haitian Dominican Border. Um, so there's diff that's another kind of local appropriation that I think is interesting to think about. So let me turn towards the last part on supporting local capabilities. And I want to turn briefly to a, a slightly different context of um, Japan after the earthquake and tsunami and nuclear meltdown of March 2011, just to point out that even highly developed countries are not immune to the issues of communication infrastructure disruption. And in Japan, when they lost their cell towers and power lines in the tsunami affected areas, news agencies and res first responders, responders resorted to things like Google, Facebook, Ustream, and Twitter to find local information. But they also needed to go to the field to update real information on the ground. So Toyota donated a thousand watt electric vehicle to send out what they called information rangers who could not only get to affected places, but could also generate power for communicating. So they could get there and then they could power up communications to satellites or to any existing Wi-Fi towers. They gathered and collected information into a bigger context map using smartphones to load up short location tagged video clips. And they were able to produce both kind of macro level news for newspapers and television, but also micro level news for people who were trying to find family members or responders trying to find out where food deliveries or water were needed. And um, Ushahidi crisis mappers started a Japanese version called Shinsa Info. But a government review of the experience in Japan, to which I ended up contributing um, via a, a World Bank and uh, government of Japan workshop that was held in Tokyo indicated that even in a highly developed and well-prepared country, emergency evacuation centers were not well prepared to use mobile technology or social media. First of all, many people who were users of social media were concentrated in urban areas. So as soon as you got out into rural areas, there was very little news um, coming into social media that way. And it suggests that more attention should be given to the urban-rural divide when it comes to communications infrastructure and skills of using it. More people needed training in social media use, how to collect and curate local news into a useful platform. Um, secondly, there were also physical and material aspects of flow that needed to be addressed. So evacuation centers in Japan lacked backup power sources and they lacked wireless base stations. So they found that they needed backup battery cells to help recharge handsets and also backup bandwidth is needed and communication service competitors actually found ways to share their um, systems with others and create a temporary network. So we had a few sort of lessons that came out of that that 
there's a need for information rangers with renewable electric power to get out to affected areas. You need backup these backup power and communication sources. You need sharing arrangements in place in case of disruption. And you need to make information available via low-cost SMS networks. Um, so these are sort of uh, one way to think about what some of the needs would be. And I'm going to try to move a little faster here. And I just want to mention the idea of repurposing infrastructure. And there's some groups, like including one here at Penn, um, called Energize the Chain, which uses power from cell towers in um, Zimbabwe to keep uh, vaccinations cold. So it's a sort of cooling system that takes the excess power from cell towers to remote rural areas and has a way to get to vaccinations to rural clinics. So that's a repurposing of communication infrastructure to make a medical um, infrastructure. There's Econet in Zimbabwe, which I, um, uses forms of mobile money um, to send money directly to people via their cell phones. And you know that exists in many parts of the world. And imagine what the Earth Haitian earthquake response would have been like if we weren't all just like tweeting in donations, but if it was being tweeted out by, by a mobile money to the people who needed the $5, the $10 donations, the $20. Like, right to them on the spot. And they had, they have the phones, they have the technology, it just needs SMS, it's very simple. And thirdly, there's an um, example of a Kenyan blood bank system, which had um, field nurses at rural hospitals send in SMS reports of, um, those are short text messages, of their, how much blood they have and, whether, and how much they need, so that you can have a sort of system to know where do we need to get extra um, blood to rural clinics for transfusions. So these are what I call hybrid solutions that mix Hertzian space, that sort of digital space, with the delivery of real goods, right? Whether it's energy or money or blood. These kinds of approaches to resilience only work if there are communities organized to appropriate the technology and to know how to use it. So that's why we also need to pay more attention to community-based organizations through robust participatory processes. And this is um, one uh, workshop that we held in Leogan where we found there were extensive grassroots collectives and organizations, but almost none of them had been engaged by outside NGOs in the post-earthquake needs assessment or recovery decision making. We held this one-day workshop, 76 people attended, representing more than 40 different community organizations. They were highly motivated to discuss options, to deliberate, to vote on what they thought were the most important water and sanitation issues their community faced. Um, and they, they were ready to take action, but nobody was asking them to do anything, to take action or to decide or to um, contribute. So far more could be achieved by getting phones, electricity, and money directly into the hands of these people. All post-earthquake planning and decision-making should have been conducted in Creole, and almost none was. All the meetings were in French or English. All outside groups should have had to partner with community organizations and should have to share technology with them. Building wider access to communication networks should be as much of a priority as delivering water or food, because this is the means through which people most effectively help themselves. So in conclusion, by paying more attention to extreme situations in which multiple infrastructures fail, I think we can get a better sense of infrastructural issues that are left in the background in more everyday contexts, but are actually crucial aspects of political and ethical debate. Digital humanitarians um, have made certain sort of good contributions, but it builds on the network capital that exists in the already highly connected world. And it won't get us very far if it stops at the edge of the already connected. There's been a great deal of concern recently about other kinds of ethical issues like data surveillance, unwarranted tracking, and data mining by powerful agencies. However, I want to suggest that an equally important ethical and political issue concerns the imbalance of power between the highly connected and those without networking capabilities and network capital. And this is more than a simple idea of a digital divide between global north and global south, because many parts of the global south are highly connected. It's in highly uneven ways, 
but it implies that there are forms of splintered infrastructure in which this, there's some who remain highly connected even in the midst of general disconnection or disruption. And that's not the same as the idea of the digital divide. We're moving through the same physical topographies, but we're connected to different Hertzian topologies of that electronic space. Bridging such hybrid spaces of electronic interactivity requires paying closer attention to the capabilities that people have already appropriated for themselves and how these might be built on to strengthen and extend their existing modes of action. And I will end there and say thank you. And just one more plug for my new book. We're having a, a book launch um, at the Philadelphia Sculpture Dream where you can bring aluminum cans and melt them down. So come for a smelting good time. <laughs> so before, before Mimi takes a question, I'm very happy to see several new faces in the room. Marina, could you pass a sheet of paper? If you could give us name, email, another, you know, we're surveilling you. Uh, just, just to add you to our mailing list. Um, otherwise, we have plenty of time for uh, questions, comments. Do you want to take questions directly? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Amber. I'm a first year PhD in anthropology. Uh, a comment and a question. First, I had the opportunity to go to Leogun this past January for two weeks to get people to people share with um, people of Asian descent from Brooklyn who've been going for the past four years and was mainly women of color. We did a lot of workshopping and uh, building and what have you. One of the things that we did was we did crocheting and aromatherapy and I was surprised to see that when we did crocheting, it was very open to see what people created. But a number of the women decided to crochet cell phone cases for oh, their nice. phones, which they hung around the neck, much like the gentleman who was in the pigeon. This was in Comier, about mm -hmm. 20 minutes outside of Leogan. Uh, so I just uh, thought that was interesting, definitely corroborating. Yeah, and I would love to be able to do the kind of ethnography of cell phone culture. Yeah. Right. So the other question was just when you're looking at how people are using computers and cell phones, I'm interested on how they're using these vessels as ways to either look at themselves when they go online, so looking at um, other communities in Haiti, connecting with friends and, and, and family, or whether they're looking at others. So the global network, the United States, um, parts of the diaspora. I'm just curious what kinds of um, networks they're accessing, especially through computers and then even cell phones um, once we have the availability of international calling. Um, so just how these computers are being used as vessels to either um, deepening the, their understandings with themselves and their own communities or whether they're looking at communities. That's interesting. Um, and, you know, I don't, I didn't research that question, so I don't have data on that. But anecdotally, I do um, use a, a Twitter feed, um, which I created during the research, which, which I, I call, call Haiti. Haiti Water. And Haiti Water is now followed by more than a thousand followers and many 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 of them are Haitian or Haitian diaspora and they connect around each other I mean and they're interconnected with each other so like just from my own personal observation there's like a strong online network amongst Haitians and both in Haiti and outside of Haiti and they are interested in Haiti so in other words they're not then maybe they're, then I'm sure they're doing other things also online, but they're also interested in themselves online. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Um, like organizations like Oxfam and um, do they have like a vested interest in not doing this? Like what? What is? Um, mm -mm. Like why? You know, have they not thought of it, or actually like they're working against it for their own? Purposes. Yeah. Oh, good question. So, okay, complicated question. But so, number one, we interviewed people in in Leogan about this, uh, Haitians, and what many of them said was that they thought the NGOs and the outside organizations um, were job opportunities for people whose career was doing this, and they wanted you know to employ themselves, and they so they had. Um, jobs and they had cars to rent and place, you know, pl nice air conditioned rooms to stay in and all this other stuff. They came, they took, people's perception was that they took a lot of the funding for the earthquake victims and used it for themselves. 
to create work and jobs for themselves. Um, now, n it was actually more like professional level Haitians who said that. The people who needed the relief, they, they were happy to get, you know, outsiders coming in and helping them. Um, and the, w the, the most shocking thing for me was that there was a, uh, an organization called Hands on Disaster Relief, which is now called All Hands Disaster Relief. They went into Leogan to work and they took over this giant unbuilt, unfinished um, nightclub that had huge cement walls and a gate, and it was basically, it looked like a fortress. They moved into the fortress and they were in an encampment, sort of in there, and they closed the gate at night, and they didn't really let many Haitians in. And they, they were the humanitarian, sort of most active in a way, all over town group. Um, and at the same time, next to the fortress was a little bar and club, and they would come out at nighttime to party and dance. And that was their main interaction with Haitians, was dancing, buying drugs, um, et cetera, prostitution. I mean, I saw all this clearly with underage children. And I was like, oh, that's, that's the humanitarian response. So while you might hear them in their meetings talk about, well, local participation, blah, 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 a, they're living in a fortress, and B, they're engaging in those kinds of activities, whatever they might say in the light of day at a public meeting. And they weren't meeting in Crail, so how much local participation could you have? Whatever their documents said and their you know, mission statements said and whatever. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my name is Katerina. I just wanted to say as a side comment as well about the jewelry and the phones and all of this. In Bulgaria, I'm Bulgarian, uh, there was a phase where it would be very popular to do that too. Not because the, there was some kind of um, response necessarily to a particular event, but people would just wear various technology sort of as a symbol. I thought it was an interesting parallel. But actually the question that I wanted to ask you, you mentioned at the beginning something about this materialist turn of communication, and this is something that you were using in your research. I'm wondering how um, how is the concept of that material materialist term that you are using uh, different from something like um, the idea of constitutive communication or the idea of a myriad of other approaches that looks at communication as something which is constitutive of um, social reality? And are you referring to any specific one? The one that pops up in my mind is a, a, a very um, organizational communication specific one. It's um, CCO as an approach. Communication is constitutive of organization. Mm -hmm. But I think that there are a myriad of terms. It's a rainbow of ideas which essentially say that communication in one way or another shapes our right. realities. Right. Okay. okay. So arguments that all right, communications shape realities. There's communication over here, and there's realities over there. And realities are kind of, you know, social, spatial, whatever. And communication is this exchange of talk, words, images, um, you know, s ways of exchanging ideas, symbols, information. And it then shapes that material world. But the perspectives I'm talking about are actually more about the materiality of the communication system and that that there's um, a sort of material structure of that but there's also a digital electronic kind of structure to that that has material effects so I guess it's more of a um, mixing I guess I think of it as mixing the two into a hybrid approach that looks at both the power of the communications, but also the power of the materiality back on the communication system. Okay, that makes sense. Yes? Thank you. Um, so a couple of months ago or so, the filmmaker Rebel Pack showed a film that I think called Fatal Assistance mm. that um, comes to very similar conclusions, but from um, a, pers a similar perspective. He, he spent two years looking at what the aid industry was doing there, and he used to yeah, and so this reinforced that in, in a really 
um, enlightening way. And one thing that he kind of came to is that not only are they bypassing local grassroots organizations, but that the sort of aid infrastructure is also bypassing the Haitian government and bullying them into sort of doing what they want and rendering them sort of incapable of intervention by coming through, you know, in Clinton and um, Clinton sort of leading the way and the UN organizers coming in, setting up shop and like it being very much about them and much of the um, much of the money just going to other places and never actually getting implemented or implemented by like projects that have nothing to do with what people need. Mm -hmm. um, so I have two questions. One, did you come across that at all with um, tensions between the state and the aid organizations? And my second question is how much, um, you, you touched upon this, but how much do you think there's like war profiteering, so to speak, or disaster profiteering, not war profiteering, that's happening from these communications industries as far as this data? Um, data gathering is going that's sort of being um, banked for the future, right? And, and thinking about development long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, I mean, tensions between the government and the NGOs, absolutely. I mean, top to bottom, 100%, whether you're talking about the local government, about government ministries, or the central, the national government. Um, all of them had tensions with working with the NGOs, the NGOs not wanting to work with them, saying that there was corruption, um, and then sort of bypassing them. And for me, the whole discourse around corruption is very problematic because if you show up in town with wads of cash to spend, then someone is gonna say, well, well can you spend some on me? Like, well, we need some over here. and it creates a cycle of so-called corruption because you have the mayor in Leogan who, all right, maybe he was a little corrupt, but um, and he ran a moonshine business, but uh, but he but he sees okay, well, there's these this people from Korea and they have all this money for an engineering project, and there's Japanese aid and they have all this money, and there's these Spanish guys and they have all this money, and he's gonna say okay, well, who's gonna do what project? I mean, and then it's like they it's as if they. Outsiders made the system work that way. It's not that the corruption is inside. That was my perception of that. Um, but it certainly, there was, the NGOs constantly would complain in their meetings about working with the government and didn't want to work with the government. Um, war profiteering, disaster profit. I mean, the whole thing was a huge profit making system in the sense of all, for every person that went to Haiti to help, how much did it cost for them to get there, to be housed there, to be transported, to do, 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 all the stuff they're doing? What, 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 if you, what if they didn't come? What if the money just went to Haiti? Like, uh, so many Haitians felt like it was totally unnecessary for all those people to be there and that they, the, the outsiders were the ones who were profiting from the whole thing. Um, in terms of data collection, I, I mean, I went to, I was part of a big NSF review of all of the Haiti Rapid Awards that they funded. And one of the big outcomes of that review was that, first of all, there should um, be cooperation in, with every team NSF funds should be helping build capacity in Haiti of academic research capacity and data collection capacity. Secondly, any data collected by U.S. funded teams should be shared and they need to find ways to share it and to help, again, build the capacity for Haiti to collect and keep its own data. And thirdly, that um, social scientists should be embedded with any sort of engineering or scientific or other teams that go because they have no clue. They're just like in their own little engineering world. They don't speak the language. They don't know the culture. They don't know what's going on. They're just like, well, why do they build their buildings like that? You know, like, let's fix it. And it's just like, that's not how it works. And then all these schemes to come up with sort of designing better shelters for after the earthquake, they're like, every single one is hopeless, like top to bottom. And Haitians would look at this like, you know, special design from Penn Praxis, let's say, like for an emergency shelter. And say, that looks like a dog kennel because like the proportions were not Haitian. And it's just like, it's just dumb stuff like that. It's like, well, if you don't begin with people's vernacular understanding of what's an appropriate shelter for a human being, you're not going to end up building the right thing. And 
So a huge disconnects on all of that stuff. And if all of the effort and money had just gone into funding things within Haiti in the first place and not bringing in so many outsiders, I think it would have been more productive. Yes. So you may have said this before we came in. Sorry, our class came in after we heard that you were speaking. Um, but um, just the ethics around the data collection. So at um, not this past HSA, so that's the Haitian Slave Association, mm -hmm. but the one before that, we had a conversation, a whole panel really around the concept of the IRB uh -huh. in the U.S., North American, European context, and how the um, regulations that Haiti actually has for doing research are not respected. And so I'm just curious as, a, as to how data is used and what the ethics are around that, what how people are following um, any North American constructs or parameters around that, if there's even any knowledge that there is actually yeah. rubrics for doing research in Haiti. That uh, that's, yeah, those are good questions. Them. And um, so at the beginning, I introduced the fact that this drew on two NSF-funded projects, except the projects were not about what I spoke about. So the projects were on a completely different topic. So there was one post-earthquake project and then one on these two lakes. Um, and so I was sort of taking the capacity to have NSF funding to go there to sort of think in other ways and reflect on what was happening. I wasn't funded to do that, and I wasn't specifically gathering data to do this project at all. And in fact, I probably couldn't get this project funded by the NSF because they don't care. It's not scientific or whatever. Um, so I had to go with these scientific projects that were doing these sort of engineering kind of things where they, have, they get more funding. Um, in fact, some of our Congress people want to like abolish social, behavioral, and economic research altogether from, from NSF funding. So. Um, so we had IRBs done because we were doing um, surveys, interviews, and a participatory workshop. And we just went through our normal university IRB, which said, you know, there, there's um, not expected to be any harm to the subjects, and we don't expect a high level of risk, and, you know, whatever the forms said. And when we w did interviews, we informed each person um, that it would be anonymized, that we didn't expect any risk to them. Um, they could stop the interview at any time. It, it was voluntary whether they wanted to participate or not. They all kind of just like stared at us and were like, yeah, yeah, can we talk to you? Like, <laughs> they were like, um, and that, and that's an interesting gap between the U.S. like version of what you have to say you're going to say to people and then you sort of say it to people and then people's understanding of what you're saying to them and like, even the term risk, like there's no risk to you. Wow, what does that, like what does that mean? Um, I don't even know. Could these questions pose a risk to someone? Could talking to these Blancs pose a risk to someone? Maybe it could. Um, so there's stuff like that. And then we trained a team of Haitian college students to do the surveys in the field because it had to be done in Creole and they had to go out and you know talk to all kinds of different people. So there was uh, six students who did the surveys. Um, that turned out to be an issue that our, the five of the six students came from Port-au-Prince and we were in Leogan. Only one of them came from Leogan. And so the Leoganais said to us, well, why didn't you train Leoganais students? And, you know, the, it was based on who our connections were with and who we were able to find and set it up with. So, um, and then finally we returned when we went back for the second research project, this this one, we went back, we did a little side trip and we went back to Leogun and we presented a final report on the research with the people who had come to the workshop, um, translated into Creole and printed up and gave it to them and said, we hope that you can use this to um, negotiate for greater like participation or decision-making input based on what we've summed up about what you said, um, they were not happy with a report. It was like a piece of paper. They were like, yeah, what are you going to do? Um, and where, and by the way, where are the media? We want media coverage of this. And we were like, oh, we didn't get the radio and the media to come here. They wanted, they wanted their opinions to be like mobilized on the radio and gotten to people in power. And they, I think they were a little disappointed that we hadn't, given it enough push. Yeah. And you have another 
question yeah. is about the materiality of the products, right? So one of the things, you, you, your great statement of the room, the water tower, and then going inside and saying you need a, you don't need a technician, you need a sociologist, um, is quite profound in the sense that technology is so important in terms of the interpersonal relationships in a community, right? So I'm just thinking to the next step, right? If there is a greater access to material resources and technology, have you thought about um, accounting for the other social and cultural dynamics that have happened? And I'm thinking of this specifically for a friend of mine in Port au Prince who pre-earthquake was just like a normal guy. And post-earthquake is like the man right and he's the man like I you know one day I saw him at the, I needed a ride and I was like who are all these people with you and he was like oh they don't really have a car but really they don't have cell phones so they're using him as this kind of source as someone who has access to things right because he has a cell phone and how all of a sudden he's just a regular guy who really had nowhere to live and now is someone who's like the man and what happens have you I don't, I'm sure you've thought about it, obviously, but what happens when that materiality, that shift actually occurs, right? And not just in terms of this larger power structure, um, mm. in terms of outside foreigners having access to power and technology, but what happens on, you know, in local interactions, right? Yeah, um, yeah, no, that's great. Um, and, and again, that's where, I, you know, I wasn't funded to really research that, but would, that would be a fantastic um, project to undertake, which is, so it was very clear, first of all, that a lot of outside organizations needed a local broker. Mm -hmm. And it could be someone who was already in Haiti, or it could be Haitian diaspora returning with them as a sort of guide. And in fact, our group needed those people because they were translating for us. We didn't speak Creole. And so that in and of itself sets up those people in positions of power. Mm -hmm. And they have access and they have, and, and especially if they're diaspora, they have the technology, they have the means, they have websites, whatever. And so they are leveraging that in a way to advance their position in the community, which may involve moving back, building a house, staying, it can involve all sorts of things, running for political office, whatever it might be. So, like, it's not exactly, like, who's an outsider and who's an insider is complicated. But then um, there's very interesting work by the anthropologist Mark Schuller on, like, the structure of organizations. And do they have a hierarchical structure or do they have a horizontal, more participatory structure? And those hierarchical organizations tend to empower the people at the top. Um, and they benefit from the, you know, disaster relief um, network kind of economy. Um, so when, when I say, at the beginning I said disasters, like they, they mobilize and they immobilize, but they demobilize and they remobilize. It's those also like local social relations where some people are sort of remobilizing into p positions of higher network capital. So that, yeah, that's a great question. I have another question. Um, did, did I catch something? Did you have one also? I had a question that was very, it was very much in line with your question and perhaps even a more simple version of it. And it's what did the communication on the ground look like? How are people in general communicating both uh, access to food and access to relief, security um, amongst themselves? Um, so, I mean, a lot of people have feature phones, you know, like a... a is it mainly cell phone communication or the other ways? Uh, if, if we were to map it, just kind of thinking of the Yeah, I mean, I, in a way, I would say, so there's a, there's a lot of um, mouth, you know, face-to-face -face communication or, like, s sending messages with other people. I would say it's an important mode of communication. So you know somebody is going to see somebody, so you pass it down the line. You say, well, tell so-and-so and such-and-such. And, such. and um, so there's a lot of, of that going on. And then there's, find, you know, knowing somebody who has a phone. So even if you don't have a phone, you know someone who can call someone. And someone who can call someone who can call someone. So, like, you, there's... Corner shops and things like that, on the like, physical topography centers. For, so, 
There, you, you know, know, so I, I didn't get to extensively research the geography of that, but just in terms of what I observed, there, I did not see um, what um, Lisa Parks has found in her research on Mongolia, which are mobile phone um, workers, but walking mobile phone sort of time sellers. Who, who, I didn't see that, but what I did see is there are little stands um, for ch where you can charge phones. And they, sometimes they were hooked up illegally to the electricity supply and then a bunch of outlets and then you could come and charge your phone there. And I think they probably also sold time just to make calls if you needed to. Um, there are little, the, the, I mean, there's tons of entrepreneurial activity. There's tons of small shops everywhere. And some of them said cyber cafe. Um, I didn't get to go in a cyber cafe, so I don't know exactly what the arrangements were for pricing and paying in those, but there are a few of those. And then there's lots of little, um, just like corner store type little, but they're more like little stands um, selling all kinds of things. And some of those sell phone communication time of some sort. Um, and there's also a, a, a system for sending money. So there's, um, you know, like mobile money. Um, where you, you, you can go to, I guess, I mean, originally it would, be, it would have been like something like a Western Union shop, but I think it's, some, it's done through like the cell phone providers now. It's mo mobile banking through cell phone providers. Yeah. Right? So is that, yeah. Is that, you know, is that so that was, I know it was starting to happen, but I don't know the extent of it at this point. I haven't because researched it. Mean, People's only experience of a bank account now is through these, you know, micro accounts on on a cell phone. Yeah, that's that's kind of a, a very interesting take on, on on mobility, which leads me to my question. That's not related to the, to what extent is social mobility traditionally understood incorporated into mobilities uh, into, into the, the mobilities paradigm? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is something I always think about. So now you know the bank, for instance, having a bank account is seen as could be interpreted as a sign of social mobility, right? And, and, you know that you have you have not necessarily savings, but it's 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 it's, it's a different um, um, relation to money. It's, it's it's as if you're moving a, a bit beyond subsistence, even mm -hmm. if it's a you know a tiny amount. Is that is that anything that that mobilities uh, research thinks about at all? Yeah. Should it? Yeah, I mean, I think it should, and it does in certain contexts, in certain situations. So, for example, there's a lot of research going on in Europe about um, uh, transportational mobility and, like, changing location of where you live yeah. mobility. And changing location of where you live has to do usually with sort of jobs and, and job access. So it's about, so they're looking at this social mobility in relation to moving somewhere else versus being able to commute somewhere else. And so the relationship between commuting patterns and potentially working um, online uh, versus needing to be somewhere physically and how the patterns of that are changing in different European countries and cities. Um, so pretty fine-grained analysis. But um, in terms of, say, somewhere like Africa and countries or Caribbean countries, I haven't seen studies of sort of social mobility and mobilities in that sense, like what's the relationship, but, but except the idea of, you know, urbanization, and obviously is sort of the mobilities of urbanization are related to social mobility. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome.